Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to another keynote for the inaugural Future of Museums Conference. This has just been so much fun, and we are so delighted to have Holly Ritchie here. Holly, welcome. Hey, how are you doing, Steve? Oh, I don't really want Holly to is the director. Yeah, Sorry? There you go. I thought I didn't really want to turn my video on, but... Uh, I've been you don't have to. There you go. <laughs> Holly's the director of the Wade Project at Western Reserve Historical Society. And I'm going to go through a couple of slides and then turn the time over to her. And then Holly, I am your wingman. I will help you through this session. So glad to have you here. Thanks to NMC.org, the New Media Consortium, and the Center for the Future of Museums, Alex Freeman and Elizabeth Merritt are the co-chairs of the conference and their two organizations are the founding partners for this event. This is a learningrevolution.com project. We do a number of live, online, large-scale conferences all around the learning professions, uh, public schools, school leadership, libraries, um, a global education conference that's five days in November, and now a future museums conference. So please join us at learningrevolution.com. Lots of fun going on. This is a chance for those of you who are live in the session to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You're going to click on it. It will open up some other icons. You click twice and put yourself on the map. And then put a note in the chat if you would. Let us know where you are, the time, the temperature. I'll show you how it's done. In Park City, Utah, I even showed you first. But it's 11 a.m. here. It's sunny and warm in the dry west of the United States. California, D.C., New York, Philadelphia, Alberta, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Alaska. How fun. Please keep those. Notes going in the chat, even though we're going to move the slide forward. Slovenia. Hey, Slovenia. You, you and Canada have made us international. We appreciate it. <laughs> Holly, I'm here for you. I'm going to turn the time over to you. And then let's try and finish, if we can, with five or ten minutes so people can take a break before the next set of sessions. All right, I don't think that ought to be a problem, Steve. I really want to thank everyone at Learning Revolution. This is a great opportunity. And I know you've been hearing some wonderful sessions over the past two days, those of you who attended yesterday's conference. And I think I'm going to talk about something a little different. And um, maybe it's a little obvious, but I'm going to share these thoughts with you anyway. I just have to figure out where my forward button is. There we go. Um, I'm Holly Witchie. I'm director of the Wade Project at Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, Ohio. There's a postcard, and there's a looking down towards my office in the reading room at Western Reserve Historical Society. My keynote today expands on a notion of intergenerosity. This is a topic that I first floated as part of a 15-minute Ideas That Matter presentation at the annual meeting of the New Media Consortium in 2013. I'm going to wait for the slides. Sorry, the slides are just catching up with me. There we go. Sorry. Ah, my background is museums. For 30 years, I've been immersed in a culture that is rich in content and poor in internal communication skills. And if you found that to be the so, I'd just like you to put a smiley face in the record over there. And so I'm using Marie Antoinette today. While it is doubtful that Marie Antoinette ever said some variant of the words on the screen, let them eat cake, we all understand essentially that the phrase let them eat cake refers to an individual who is clueless about the realities of life for the vast majority of a population. This is the key to my remarks today. We are part of the crowd we keep talking about when we talk about crowdsourcing. As a rule, individuals and institutions understand their own needs slightly better than they, or we, understand the needs of others. The idea behind inner generosity is that when we are more mindful of our relationships with our current colleagues, both within our institution 
and among other institutions, and with students and emerging professionals, there are collateral advantages to us personally as well as institutionally. Now I'm going to tell you a parable. I've spent most of my career working in or for art museums. And I spent a decade in the big art museum world. You can think of big art museums as the royalty of the museum world because, with very few exceptions, they have most of the money, most of the opportunities, and most of the power. Marie Antoinette probably didn't know a large number of French peasants. And if you've worked your entire career at a big art museum, sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around the idea that the vast majority of museums in the United States have significantly fewer resources than you do. Let's face it, in the economy of museums, big art museums are the 1%. And so, the parable of the Sharpie. I had the opportunity to hear an outstanding curator of American art talk about a successful project he has implemented to reframe 19th century paintings in the collection for which he's responsible. At the end of the presentation, someone asked about the cost of the frames, and he cheerfully acknowledged that the cost hovers around the $20,000 mark for an appropriate frame. Now, this is not a particularly shocking number in the big art museum world, but it is a shocking number to the curator of collections at a local historical society who I'd witnessed just the previous week seeking volunteers to clean glass and to touch up some of their frames with Sharpies. Now, to be fair, there's a completely different level of attention to detail required for a Frederick Church landscape than there is for an engraving with historical interest but little monetary value. Still, the situation is what it is. Some museums have a lot, some have a little. Let's look at the situation briefly in terms of new technologies. Two screenshots. On the left, the beautiful website for the Metropolitan Museum of Art caught at the moment of an elegant transition from one lovely image to the next. On the right, the Sheboygan County hosted webpage for the Sheboygan County Historical Society and Museum. The term media divide can be used to describe the divide between what a museum can offer and what the public expects online. Museums with more money, more staff, more tools, and a strategic plan for their online presence are better able to satisfy the public than the vast majority of museums dependent upon the kindness of government agencies, one-off funding, Bob the IT guy, or the new young staff member charged with an institution's online presence because he or she was born digital. The media divide is thus the gulf between what a museum can offer and what the audience expects. The digital divide, on the other hand, is the economic and social inequality, and in this case I'm talking about the digital di di divide among museums, um, in their access to, use of, knowledge of information and communication technologies. Given the speed of technological change, the divide between the haves and the have-nots continues to grow. Thus, rolled into this idea of inner generosity is encouraging museum professionals to seek effective ways for tools and technologies and lessons learned by the haves to help the have-nots. Now, I put on the screen a, a screenshot from an article that appeared in the New York Times called, Does Technology Make Us More Alone? Does it make us more alone? Absolutely. And the more exciting the projects at well-funded museums, the more pressure there is on smaller entities to play catch-up. This often means the diversion of funds from core, mission-driven, less glamour, glamorous responsibilities, think cataloging, digital asset management, content management, and collections care, into one-off showy installations using the next great technologies. These projects seldom fulfill the anticipated return on investment. Don't misunderstand me. I want all the exciting projects to continue. I celebrate with colleagues who have the opportunities to make magic, but because we are talking about the future of museums here today, in the future, I hope to see more collaboration and less focus on being the first the best, the biggest, or the most comprehensive museum. Call me crazy, but at the end of the day, 
wouldn't building a project that made three, four, ten, twenty, or a hundred institutions better able to serve their audiences be more rewarding? For some of you, the answer will be, heck no, it's survival of the fittest in the world of cultural heritage organizations. For some of you, however, I hope the answer will be yes. In the future, I hope that the funders of national leadership projects for museums, particularly those involved in the creation of new tools and technologies for engagement, will encourage applicants to build flexible tools, include a strategic plan for training those in large museums and small on the use of tools, and then give the tools away, or at least make them affordable. That's my rant. I may have a few more rants in me today. And as Robin Sparkle says, let's go to the mall. Wait, that's the wrong kind of mall. Let's go to a different kind of mall. If you've got a mall, you've got it made. Now, I don't really mean to insinuate that communication and collaboration are easy if you work in an organization in an extremely popular centralized mecca. I'm just saying it's easier to be collaborative when you can walk across the street and convince the introverted kid on the block to come in and play in the sandbox with the rest of the kids. The folks who work in and around the cultural institutions in these malls are doing some of the most innovative work. And I'd like to talk about the three I know best, just briefly, moving from the West Coast to the East Coast, San Diego's Balboa Park, Cleveland's University Circle, and of course, the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Balboa Park is a destination. San Diego is a destination. And Balboa Park is a, mo is a model for collaboration on multiple levels. Just to mention a few, there's the Balboa Park Online Collaborative, the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership, and the Balboa Park Learning Institute. The various successful collaborative efforts of these San Diego organizations, great projects, the creation of common tools, lessons learned, and grants earned, are really a testament to what can happen when you take the conversation about what museums need and need to do to the broader community of cultural institutions and include participants large and small. San Diego is a vacation destination. Cleveland, Ohio, not so much. Nevertheless, Cleveland's Wade Park, better known as the University Circle, is the fastest growing employment center in Northeast Ohio and home to more than a dozen museum and cultural institutions, major hospitals, and a research university. The entity which encourages collaboration in the square mile area, University Circle Inc., or UCI, is a development, service, and an advocacy organization that's responsible for the growth of University Circle. It doesn't um, promote collaborative projects between the institutions. What UCI does is work to ensure that the area has a vibrant network of housing options, enough hotel rooms, and dining options to meet the needs of those who work at and visit the university healthcare institutions, including the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals, and the various cultural institutions, including the Cleveland Orchestra and the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and my own Western Reserve Historical Society. UCI is charged with keeping the neighborhood clean, safe, and attractive for the more than 3 million people who visit, learn, work, and live here each year, not with developing technological infrastructure or collaborative projects. Being significant. The institutions and memorials on the National Mall are the primary heart and soul of our nation's cultural heritage in a way that is unlike any other grouping of institutions in the United States. Citizens require that these institutions singly and as a unit be larger than life. They need not only to meet our expectations, but they need to exceed our expectations to live up to the grand design viewed from the airplane window. More than any other geographic location I can think of, museum colleagues in Washington, D.C., whether consciously or not, grapple continuously with the idea of what it means to actually have to be all things to all people. Having lived and worked in both San Diego and Cleveland, and having spent significant time in D.C. over the past 30 years, I think there would be a lot to learn from an overview of best practices at least three types of complexes. And there are no doubt more cultural parks that could be added to the conversation. 
So I guess that's a goal for my future too, is for this colloquium to be held about malls and how collaboration works um, in partnerships. In any event, mall or no mall, we can all do better. Intergenerosity asks us to consider the benefits of working with one another inside our institutions, working with other cultural heritage professionals in our communities, and working on behalf of emerging professionals and students. So, in the last five or ten years, we've gotten a lot better at understanding what we as museums value. And here are three things that we value, and of course there's Nina, the cover of Nina Simon's The Participatory Museum uh, book. We value inclusivity, storytelling, and intergenerational learning. These are the qualities that we value and that we want to bring to our audiences. Inclusivity is really the feeling that everyone is welcome and adds value to an institution. Storytelling, we know, is important because harnessing the power of the story, of our stories, is key to future success. We need to learn how to better measure the effectiveness of the stories we tell, and we need to be much better listeners to the stories others want to tell us. And intergenerational learning. Museums, zoos, national parks, historic houses, cultural gardens, halls of fame, we are all locations for intergenerational learning and for inter- and intercultural learning. At some point in your career or personal life, haven't you observed or even been a part of that one perfect moment when generations or cultures connect? And if you're bored with listening to me, you can uh, talk about those perfect moments over in the sidebar. We know that these qualities, inclusivity, stories and learning are invaluable in our relationships with our visitors. But aren't they also exactly the qualities we ought to be seeking in our relationships with colleagues within our own institutions and colleagues at other museums? Now listen, I am not a creepy futuristic Pollyanna seeking museums that exhibit a Stepford-like cheerful homogeneity of experience in both the front and the back of the house. I want future museums to do a much better job from cradle to grave in the profession, validating contributions and historical experience of senior museum professionals, providing mid-career employees with continued training, and perhaps most important, nurturing the next generation of museum professionals. So, from my perspective, who's walking the walk and what can we learn from them? Of the many examples of inner generosity I've collected over the past couple of years, I'd like to briefly draw your attention to a few of my current favorites. Um, some are drawn from the museum world, and some aren't. Here's my first example. If I have a favorite institution in the country right now, it is the Sheboygan County Historical Society and Museum, because of the relationship they've built with their community. Last year, Robert Harper, the director for 23 years, retired. Harper ensured that his successor, Travis Gross, shared a commitment to community service and an understanding of the role volunteers and visitors play in the success of the institution. That's Travis up in the, in the photograph in the upper, upper right. He's standing in the doorway of the director's office. There are a few things I'd like to point out to you in these photographs. First, the open door and the vast expanse of the windows in the director's office looking both into the hallway where the children are standing and outside um, to, uh, and to the outside if you look through the office. There, um, in all the times I've spent there, I've never seen the director's office door close. Travis isn't in a protected space on the top floor of the institution, removed from the public. He is visibly present and always willing to engage with visitors. In the photograph on the upper right, you see the volunteer wall of fame. The names are not etched into bronze, nor are they laminated on text and, and adhered to the wall. This is a list that grows week by week throughout the course of the year. As each event takes place, the list of volunteers go up, and there is a palpable record of those who give time, whether an hour, 10 hours, or 100 hours. Gifts of time and manpower are valued. 
This wall of fame is directly opposite the director's office, so he's reminded about what's going on in his institution. And at each of the museum's events, photographs are taken. And that's what you see running along the wall outside of the director's office and behind the staff of the institution, the entire staff, I might add. This bank of photographs grows throughout the year as well, and people come and visit this bank of photographs and show their families and point out what they're doing and explain the activities. It's fantastic. At the Sheboygan County Historical Society and Museum, volunteers are valued and are as necessary to the institution as breathing is to the body. The institution, institution belongs to everyone. And if there were a way I could clone the staff and have them go on the road, and talk about how they connect with community. I would do it. Um, this is Tony Wortham. I feel really privileged to have met Tony. Um, I was riding on a train from D.C. to Baltimore on a Sunday evening, and I had gone see a Folger Shakespeare comedy and had had a wonderful day, and I was standing in line waiting for the train in that line that goes to get on the train, and I started talking to Tony. Tony had just completed a weekend's volunteer work as part of a veterans field trip to Washington, D.C. to visit the memorials and to actually show the government at work in the Congress and the Senate. Tony's a veteran himself and was homeless for a number of years before being, in his words, saved by a VA program that helps veterans find housing. The HUD-sponsored program for Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing, called HUDVASH, helped Tony put his life back together, and now he's paying it forward. He writes a newsletter for Hudvash for Baltimore veterans, which features stories about, with articles about wellness, information about how vets, and particularly homeless vets, can get help with their cases, life skills, and recreational opportunities. He also volunteers at events that enable current veterans to connect with those of earlier wars and conflicts, and to share stories and experiences. And because I was going to talk to, about him today, I sent him an email yesterday just to catch up with him. And uh, he immediately replied to me. And Tony, who's in his early 60s um, and is a dancer by training, is uh, writing a musical about his life. And he says, uh, and what it's like to be a veteran coming home with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And he says there's a lot of uh, big numbers in the show. And I can't wait. To, uh, I can't wait. I'm hoping to buy tickets in the front row when Tony's musical is, uh, is shown. Business schools. Business schools. And it's more than just networking. In terms of full disclosure, the gentleman at the bottom left is my husband, Kurt. When I showed him the photograph I'm using, he said, it doesn't really look like I'm walking the walk. It looks like I'm drinking the drink. Kurt's a graduate of the Weatherhead School of Business at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And for the past four years, he has mentored Chinese MBA students coming from mainland China. Three of our extended family are seen above helping out with trick-or-treating last Halloween. Any benefits they receive from my husband in terms of professional and or fatherly advice are amply repaid by the attention he receives in turn from these young people as they transition from being students far from home and family and to talented men and women prepared to make a difference in the workplace. At a time in life when our own 21-year-old is naturally separating from the family, our Chinese children respectfully acknowledge our experience and we feel like we are doing our part by helping them however possible. Everyone's a winner in this situation, I think. Next screen. Sorry. There we go. Brown bag lunches. I'm a fan. What's not to love about a lunch and learn program? I took the screenshot you see from the East Dallas Chamber of Commerce, but I could just as easily point it out the Getty brown bag series. Bottom line about brown bag lunches is there are lots of topics that can be covered in an hour that would raise the bar in unexpected ways for those within institutions and for communities of institutions. Did you know that there are people who are afraid of Microsoft Office suite of tools? Maybe you are one of these people. I know I'm afraid of Excel. Um, perhaps it's Photoshop that's got you mystified. 
Or maybe you'd like to know why the baby Jesus is holding a goldfish in a painting in the galleries. Or the best way to safely clean silver. Or how an apple core actually works. Or what a wombat likes best to eat. Is there someone on your staff who can answer questions, teach, and talk to people? You'd be surprised at who might turn up for a brown bag lunch. Engaging others. And it's really more than enter and intercultural learning, even though I've got two intercultural projects on the screen. Um, Zuni children and elders and intangible heritage. I want to focus briefly on intangible heritage. I heard a representative of the Princess Mari Chakri Sirenhorn Anthropology Center in Thailand. Sorry, I have to take a breath because that's a long thing to say. Um, I heard a representative discuss a project which involved the training of adolescents in small rural villages to interview their grandparents and elders about what childhood was like in their life and what happened in their subsequent lives. Though the students used cheap laptops to gather information, the outcome of the project was printed out pieces of paper with stories and pictures pasted to boards in the villages for everyone to look at and discuss. Those of us in the audience were moved to tears as we watched the video of those interviewed getting a first look at their own stories. Watching the final video, I felt very much like the visitor to Colonial Williamsburg who was quoted in a 2007 research report. Quote, it made me feel as though I were there. It made me feel as though these circumstances were really happening to me and that my life would be impacted by these happenings. It felt important, very important, unquote. Right. Fair enough. Yes, yes, Holly. But what can I do? So, I have some suggestions. Three skills. You can practice three skills. Hope, mindfulness, and compassion. And again, I am not a Pollyanna. I'm being practical and thinking about the future of museums. These human correct characteristics are deemed desirable for employees based on the latest research into emotional intelligence. So, let's talk a little bit about each of them. First of all, hope. And uh, uh, I'm an art historian by training, so you're going to see a little Durr in the next couple of slides. Um, Durr's uh, master Shika, his master engravings. Hope. Do not be the complainer. Do not be the whiner. And do not be the gossip in your office. Um, and if someone's out there who knows me is saying, that's the pot calling the kettle black, I acknowledge I have been that person. And if offered a do-over in my career, I'd have a lot of do-overs that I could choose from. Mindfulness. You've got to know the person who is walking around in your shoes before you can step into the shoes of another. So do you understand what you bring to the table in an institution? How does what you do or do not do impact the work of others? What can you do better? And what skills do you need to upgrade? And the last quality is compassion. Oops. Are you an employee at a museum with a lot of resources? How about setting aside three hours a month to see if there's a partner institution that might benefit from some help? Are you an employee in a department with folks who have software, hardware, accounting, business, design, or organizational skills? Some range of talents that, if shared, could make life just a little bit easier for a subset of other employees? How about a bag lunch, a 15-minute quick tutorial after an all-staff meeting, or open office hours one morning a month? Are you on the opposite end of the stick in these examples? Do you need some kind of help? If you do, ask for it and be creative. Now, the great thing about being asked to do a keynote is you can kind of do what you want. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to share just a couple of my favorite are my current heroes. Uh, up on the far right, looking off uh, towards the camera with blonde hair, 
is Alyssa Purvis. Alyssa is an emerging professional in museum marketing and communications. She enjoys life and her work. Coworkers claim never to have seen her less than enthusiastic and always with a smile on her face, despite the evidence offered by this photograph. I had the occasion to speak with more than 15 of her colleagues, and most of them had something to say about Alyssa's ability to change the mood in a room or in a meeting. Next to Alyssa, to the left, is Dr. Edward J. Olszewski, Emeritus Professor of Art History. He's made mentoring students job one from the time he began teaching. Even in retirement, he never fails to step up to the plate to help a student or former student reach their career goals. Last week, I wrote him about a student who was hesitant to contact him about an idea she had for an article. She feared he wouldn't remember her. Whether he remembered her or not, within the hour, he had invited her to lunch, and I have no doubt that there will be an article forthcoming. The gentleman on the far left is Dr. John Grabowski. American history is his passion, and collections are important in this, too. His passion is not just the history of royalty and robber barons, but the history of working communities. He can tell you the family names of the stone workers who built the great museums and bridges in Cleveland. For 30 years, he has worked to bring hidden histories to light, from the concerns of socialist workers at the turn of the 20th century to LGBT communities before the Stonewall Rebellion of 1869. And with each new story, he's as excited as he was for the last one. The young lady standing, uh, sitting next to John is Galena Olmsted, and the gentleman on the bottom is Jack Ludden from the Getty. I grouped Jack and Galena together because they are present examples of my ideal museum professionals of the future. Intelligent, thoughtful, with excellent problem-solving skills, a nimble ability to learn from any past mistakes, however infrequent, a willingness to ask questions and to listen to the answers, generous with help to others, and the ability to look at the world with a finely tuned sense of humor. So those are just some of my heroes, and I bet you could name four or five heroes in your life, too. So how can museums help museums? Remember, you are part of the crowd that can be crowdsourced. Neither the problems nor the solutions that you're trying to solve need to be epic in nature. So I've got an action plan for you today. Oh, before I go on to the action plan, um, where's the opportunity? I just put up a, a, a couple of screenshots up there. Um, beneath the where's the opportunity uh, graphic um, are the community service guidelines. High school students in Washington, D.C., public schools, were the first students to have public service guidelines in, um, uh, as part of their graduation requirements. And in high school, they're uh, required to do 100 hours of public service. And then there's this fantastic um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I think there was someone here from Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, University of Nebraska in Lancaster County has uh, a page that has 352 community service ideas. I think that's awesome. So you can go to that site and find an idea. There are lots of model programs out there, but there's no reason to wait for a formal uh, program. So here's my action plan. Do something generous this week, and then repeat a generous action weekly for the rest of your life. How's that? Um, in a generosity, the bad news is you can't mandate it or legislate it. The good news is you can practice it and model the behavior and the better you get at it, the more natural it will seem. Inner generosity is when you can step back for a minute and say to a coworker, a subordinate, or the boss, this is a good person dealing with a difficult time or task. I'm going to do what I can to make it easier. If you are a senior museum professional and you haven't made a call or written a letter in support of an emerging professional recently, Maybe it's time you looked around to see if there's someone who might need some mentoring. If you are an intern or an emerging professional and it has never occurred to you to ask your supervisor or your professor 
to discuss the life and career trajectories that brought them to the museum? Maybe you should think about having that conversation. Inner generosity is easy. All you have to do to get started is hold out your hand or pick up the phone or write an email and say, let's grab a cup of coffee. I'd like to get to know you better. All right. I have a couple of closing thoughts. Let's see what they are. Oh, some closing thoughts. There we go. Um, I don't think I really need to read this slide to you, um, but I will. Life is easier if you have a sense of humor and don't take yourself seriously. Um, and I don't know about you, and it's completely stupid that whenever I'm feeling a little bit down, I just type in baby laughing to tearing pieces of paper. And if you haven't seen this video, you just ought to see it, unless you're someone who doesn't like babies, in which case, don't watch it. And sometimes three ladies dancing is just three ladies dancing. But occasionally, just occasionally, there's a hidden message. Botticelli's three graces may or may not be a visual representation of a pithy Renaissance aphorism, a gift given is twice returned. Again, I promise you, once you start doing a generous action once a week, uh, you and your, uh, your institution will be amply repaid. All right, look at this, Steve. I'm ending up a little early, I think. Um, I'm going to leave you with two final quotes. Um, a reminder via Charles Dickens of our overarching message, mission. The quote on the screen, I'll let you read for yourself. What I'm really interested, more interested in, is the transformation of Scrooge. And I'd like to see museums be more positive uh, uh, places in the future. So uh, I don't know how many of you can quote the last words, and I'm reading it. I'm certainly not quoting it. Scrooge became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and he little heeded them. For he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. And knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes in grins as have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. And that is quite enough me. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Okay, so it's really hard to find the applause button here, but if you hover over the smiley face and go down to applause, or just click any button, and Holly will know what it means. Hey, Holly, we have a couple of minutes now. Uh, we're certainly, uh, people will appreciate the break, I'm sure. But do you feel like there has been a change in the last 25 or 30 years in terms of professional generosity. Um, and I'm wondering specifically sort of about the Lash's culture of narcissism and the idea of, you know, uh, kind of the, the consumer industrial economic culture. Um, has, has it changed over time? Um, has it changed in the past, has <laughs> it changed in the past 30 years? You know, I've just really started thinking about this seriously in the past couple of years. Um, one of the things that I've changed is, you know, we know, we know through emotional intelligence that when you do something for someone else, it makes you feel better. And so one of the things that, if it hasn't changed, will change. Again, we've got all of these um, emerging professionals um, and museum studies students who are coming up through the ranks and art historians and historians who have done community service in high school. More and more colleges are having people do community service. Um, so, you know, in a way, I think community service can be kind of like a drug. Once you, once you get into doing things for people, you feel more like doing anything. One of the, one of the changes that, um, and why I originally started talking about this idea of inner generosity is uh, I go to a lot of technology conferences, and frequently in technology conferences, um, I hear someone saying, 
um, curators don't understand me. Curators don't even try to understand what I do. And, you know, my response to that is, do you try to understand what they do? I think part of the, 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 what the, the fast pace of technology has done is we've got a significant number of senior museum professionals who really feel like what they bring to the table is no longer valued. And when you put that with emerging professionals who would really like to have jobs and don't see anyone going anywhere, we've got a problem. And so what I'd like to see is more uh, model programs. Uh, I, I, I was thinking one, you know, what would it be, uh, you know, if you had, instead of a traditional curatorial assistant, but you can have a curatorial assistant too, what if you paired emerging professionals who have um, the content and technology skills with senior professionals who have the content and the historical memory and let them each do what they're best at and learn from one another. Because one of the real problems is um, senior professionals leaving the field and institutions being left without historical memory. And I think that's, that's a shame too because um, when someone leaves an institution grumpily, there's no chance to sort of capture what it was, what that magic was that made them want to work at that institution in the first place. Um, all of us, all of us, even though we we uh, lose track of track, we lose track of it at some point, had a reason to originally go into the museum field. You know, had that experience that made us know that's what we wanted to be, or that teacher that inspired us. And um, the people who uh, uh, teach um, the emotional intelligence. Uh, class of the case, and I took one of those Coursera courses with 70,000 of my closest friends um, uh, last year, and they have you do this exercise, and I'm, I'm happy to do this exercise. I think I can do it. It's not copy written. Um, so everybody out there, shut your eyes, and I want you to think of the worst supervisor you ever had. Can you picture that person, worst professor, the worst supervisor you ever had, okay? Can you, can you see a one event where that person, where that really uh, exemplifies how bad um, a supervisor or a teacher that was? Now, type for me the words, any adjectives that you can think of that describe that experience. What kind of adjectives describe the bad experience with someone? What did they do? How did they make you feel that make you feel bad about it? Anyone want to type anything? Has everybody left? Critical. Good stuff. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Untrustworthy. Sure. Condescending. Self-centered and clueless. Awesome. Demanding. Controlling. Right. <laughs> Psychotic. Thanks, Stacy. And lazy. Ambushed. Inept and elitist. Terrific. Okay. Everybody close your eyes again. Think of the best mentor, teacher, supervisor you ever, ever had. Can you see that person's face? Can you think of an experience that you had with that person? And tell me the adjectives. There you go. Encouraging, supportive, supportive. Look at that. It's supportive, supportive, supportive. We get that over and over and over again. So um, really gathering the adjectives are just busy work for you to do in this exercise. The point of this exercise is which part of the exercise made you feel better? Thinking about the person you didn't like or thinking about the person you did like? It's not a trick question. Did you feel did you feel better rehearsing old right rehearsing old grievances or reappreciating someone that you hadn't thought about for a while? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, appreciative inquiry. So you know, uh, wouldn't it be more fun, more like why we got into the business for the, in the first place, if we spent more time in the latter part? thinking about and being the kind of person uh, to others that, that we appreciate and that person who is a mentor to us. And um, you don't have to be the supervisor to be the mentor. 
You know, I uh, there's a wonderful person at Western Reserve Historic, a wonderful woman that I work with. Her name is Monica Butcha. She's an, an emerging professional. And um, uh, we've got six, I've got six public history interns this summer. And she taught, she took the time to teach one of the interns how to make an Excel spreadsheet. And you would have thought she had, I don't know, baked her a cake and, and, uh, and put a tiara on this young woman's head. She was so happy. So little things help. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question, Steve. <laughs> I'm not even sure you answered the question, <laughs> but I'm quite okay with it. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we've got, this is a nice 15-minute break. You get a break. There are two sessions coming up in the next hour. Um, we'll give you a little bit of a longer break this time. I am clapping again. So nice to get to know you, Holly. Thank you so much for being a part of this inaugural event. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much for coming today. I personally appreciate the message. <laughs> Take care, everybody. The way this works is I'll turn the recording off, and then we actually bump you out of the room so that the recording will process it. will go up in the next 15 or 20 minutes. And then the YouTube version will go up in the next couple of days. Take care. Bye now. World, because with very few exceptions, they have most of the money, most of the opportunities, and most of the power. Marie Antoinette probably didn't know a large number of French peasants. And if you've worked your entire career at a big art museum, Sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around the idea that the vast majority of museums in the United States have significantly fewer resources than you do. Let's face it, in the economy of museums, big art museums are the 1%. And so, the parable of the Sharpie. I had the opportunity to hear an outstanding curator of American art talk about a successful project he has implemented to reframe 19th century paintings in the collection for which he's responsible. At the end of the presentation, someone asked about the cost of the frames, and he cheerfully acknowledged that the cost hovers around the $20,000 mark for an appropriate frame. Now, this is not a particularly shocking number in the big art museum world, but it is a shocking number to the curator of collections at a local historical society who I'd witnessed just the previous week seeking volunteers to clean glass and to touch up some of their frames with Sharpies. Now, to be fair, there's a completely different level of attention to detail required for a Frederick Church landscape than there is for an engraving with historical interest but little monetary value. Still, the situation is what it is. Some museums have a lot, some have a little. Let's look at the situation briefly in terms of new technologies. Two screenshots. On the left, the beautiful website for the Metropolitan Museum of Art caught at the moment of an elegant transition from one lovely image to the next. On the right, the Sheboygan County hosted webpage for the Sheboygan County Historical Society and Museum. The term media divide can be used to describe the divide between what a museum can offer and what the public expects online. Museums with more money, more staff, more tools, and a strategic plan for their online presence are better able to satisfy the public than the vast majority of museums dependent upon the kindness of government agencies, one-off funding, Bob the IT guy, or the new young staff member charged with an institution's online presence because he or she was born digital. The media divide is thus the gulf between what a museum can offer and what the audience expects. The digital divide, on the other hand, is the economic and social inequality, and in this case I'm talking about the digital di di divide among museums, um, in their access to, use of, knowledge of information and communication technologies. Given the speed of technological change, the divide between the haves and the have-nots continues to grow. Thus, rolled into this idea of inner generosity is encouraging museum professionals to seek effective ways for tools and technologies and lessons learned by the haves to help the have-nots. Now, I put on the screen uh, a screenshot from an article that appeared in the New York Times called Does Technology Make Us More Alone? Does it make us more alone? Absolutely. And the more exciting the projects at well-funded museums, the more pressure there is on smaller entities to play catch-up. The media consortium 
in 2013. I'm going to wait for the slides. Sorry, the slides are just catching up with me. There we go. Sorry. Ah, my background is museums. For 30 years, I've been immersed in a culture that is rich in content and poor in internal communication skills. And if you found that to be the so, I just like you to put a smiley face in the record over there. And so I'm using Marie Antoinette today. While it is doubtful that Marie Antoinette ever said some variant of the words on the screen, let them eat cake, we all understand essentially that the phrase let them eat cake refers to an individual who is clueless about the realities of life for the vast majority of a population. This is the key to my remarks today. We are part of the crowd we keep talking about when we talk about crowdsourcing. As a rule, individuals and institutions understand their own needs slightly better than they, or we, understand the needs of others. The idea behind inner generosity is that when we are more mindful of our relationships with our current colleagues, both within our institution and among other institutions, and with students and emerging professionals, there are collateral advantages to us personally as well as institutionally. Now I'm going to tell you a parable. I've spent most of my career working in or for art museums. And I spent a decade in the big art museum world. You can think of big art museums as the royalty of the museum world. Sure. I'll show you how it's done. In Park City, you know, I only showed you first. But it's 11 a.m. here. It's sunny and warm in the dry west of the United States. California, D.C., New York, Philadelphia, Alberta, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Alaska. How fun. Please keep those notes going in the chat, even though we're going to move the slide forward. Slovenia. Hey, Slovenia. You, you and Canada have made us international. We appreciate it. <laughs> Holly, I'm here for you. I'm going to turn the time over to you, and then let's try and finish if we can with five or ten minutes so people can take a break before the next set of sessions. All right. I don't think that ought to be a problem, Steve. I really want to thank everyone at Learning Revolution. This is a great opportunity, and I know you've been hearing some wonderful sessions over the past two days, those of you who attended yesterday's conference, and I think I'm going to talk about something a little different, and um, maybe it's a little obvious, but I'm going to share these thoughts with you anyway. I just have to figure out where my forward button is. There we go. Um, I'm Holly Witchie. I'm director of the Wade Project at Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, Ohio. There's a postcard, and there's a looking down towards my office in the reading room at Western Reserve Historical Society. My keynote today expands on a notion of intergenerosity. This is a topic that I first floated as part of a 15-minute Ideas That Matter presentation at the annual meeting of the Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to another keynote for the inaugural Future of Museums conference. This has just been so much fun, and we are so delighted to have Holly Ritchie here. Holly, welcome. Hey, how are you doing, Steve? Oh, I don't really Holly want to turn director. Of, yeah, there you go. I thought I didn't really want to turn my video on, but uh, I've been you don't have to. Nice. There you go. <laughs> Holly's the director of the Wade Project at Western Reserve Historical Society, and I'm going to go through a couple of slides and then turn the time over to her. And then Holly, I am your wingman. I will help you through this session. So glad to have you here. Thanks to NMC.org, the New Media Consortium, and the Center for the Future of Museums. Alex Freeman and Elizabeth Merritt are the co-chairs of the conference, and their two organizations are the founding partners for this event. This is a learningrevolution.com project. We do a number of live, online, large-scale conferences all around the learning professions, uh, public schools, school leadership, libraries, um, a global education conference that's five days in November, 
And now a future museums conference. So please join us at learningrevolution.com. Lots of fun going on. This is a chance for those of you who are live in the session to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You're going to click on it. It will open up some other icons. You click twice and put yourself on the map. And then put a note in the chat if you would. Let us know where you are, the time, the temperature.